the audio working? Working. Sounds good. All right, so welcome to um, a live streamed event for Jug Brandenburg Berlin. Thank you guys very much for, for having us here. Um, Sebastian and myself drove up today via motorcycle from Munich, so we're going to be driving all around Germany, visiting different user groups, um, going to Java land, and we have well, you guys, you guys are being live streamed now, so, so wave hi to folks who are watching online. <laughs> um, and let's, let's say hi to some folks. Okay, let's start with the user group leader. So would you hold the mic close to your mouth. Yeah, okay. So um, hi, uh, live audience. Oh, I should have trained that on Periscope before. So yeah, welcome to Berlin, and uh, everybody wave hi. <laughs> <laughs> volunteers. Volunteers first. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As so always. Go. Hi from Berlin. I work at uh, Access Tolina, who is doing software for uh, uh, for cities, for banks. We are program, programming in Java. So. Um, we do uh, JSF. Uh, we work with Spring or the. And a, Hi guys, my name is Florian. I'm local. I'm working at Immobilien Scout. It's a platform for finding real estates. <laughs> for if someone doesn't know, um, yeah, we have really pretty different uh, technology st stacks. In my team, it's more or less uh, AngularJS front end, Spring Boot back end, and AWS whatever <laughs> components for yeah, do some cloud stuff. Yeah. So let's see. Okay, so Sebastian is going to start and talk a little bit about what are you talking about? JaxRS and Yes, I'm going to talk. Hi, my name is Sebastian. I'm from Munich. Um I'm going to talk about hypermedia with REST, so real REST. Uh, hypermedia REST with uh, Juxa REST and how to implement this using Java EE technology. All right, cool. I'm switching over to both your mic on both channels. All right. Are you going to switch to your desktop once you're ready? Um, I have to do this here? I'll do it. Okay. So, yeah, I am on that. See that? All right. So yes, hi. <laughs> My name is Sebastian, and I'm talking about uh, Hypermedia REST today. So um, I'm a freelancer, actually, and I've seen a lot of different projects, and all of them use REST, or what they call REST. Um, yes, and these are real-world examples of what is uh, considered to be REST. Well, um, there's often to be said this, this difference between REST and SOAP, but sometimes it's not really clear when you see at, at the examples you see in the real world. So something like this. Um, you have a resource, a URL, do some action, maybe ver a verb plus something, and you're, you're passing some parameters and you get some, something else back, which actually feels just like a remote procedure call. So if you look at it, it's nothing else like SOAP with out the soap envelope, and yeah, that's it. So that's not really REST, uh, should not uh, be considered as REST. Yeah, it's just like a, a remote procedure call. And the same is uh, true for the other example. You are actually getting some information from somewhere, but using POST, because it's always POST. And this is, again, like, like a remote procedure call. You uh, can already read that from the URL. Um, but what REST should be about, not only, is resources. So every, 
uh, every URL uh, you have is a resource. Uh, per definition, and these resources should, in fact, reflect your business object, which means you don't have like like a method name, do some action, rather than have like a thing, like an object, like your business entities, what your application should be about. So if you do at Immobilien Scout, it should be like real estates, like flats, like maybe users or something, and that should be reflected somehow in, in your URL, right? So something like this, users. You have the um, resource users, which are in fact a list of users, and you're getting um, the users, not, not post anymore, which is good. And you get the response back in XML, it could be uh, JSON, it could be any, anything else, actually it doesn't matter. And you can actually access all the users by iterating through that list. And the point is here how to get the URLs, because I will later come to Hypermedia, and that's, that's kind of the point of this. You assume, um, I often heard actually that REST should be something about predictable URLs, which I partly agree. But the application, or um, more specifically the client, should not do some implicit logic about how to construct the URLs, because this is what I see pretty often that you say, okay, users, because it sounds nice, users, and then you assume that in this case, the ID 12345 is be taken and concatenated by users slash 12345, and that's the user. That may be correct in the, some term, but that's somehow implicit logic. And yeah, what you see here already, it's the use of semantic HTTP. This is already better. You don't use a post to actually just read um, a resource, you're using the HTTP verbs, how they are meant to be, and you should use the status codes, how they are meant to be, actually. So like this example, you want to create a new user here named Duke, so you're posting to the user's resource, because it should be a new user, and you get the response back. It's not like 200, okay, plus a big uh, XML from your method call, like before. Rather than it says, okay, it uses a status code, because if you read the RFC of HTTP, there were different status codes, and they all have somehow meaning, a, a semantic. And this is what, for uh, this example, 201 created is for, that you say, okay, this resource, this new resource you wanted to have, by adding that new user, is now being created, and 201 created says, oh, that's fine. And it also directs you to a location, this is an HTTP header, saying, okay, I created that new resource for you, and this is the location of the new resource. That's much better than um, just in plain text return, this is what I often see, the ID, 12345, and then you have to assume again that the resource probably will be user slash 12345. The same story. And this is exactly the point where uh, hypermedia kicks in because you want to direct the reuser. Actually, Hypermedia is about using your API how you would, in fact, use a website as a human. You go to, I don't know, immobilienscout.com and you search all the uh, apartments, and then you have a look at the HTML output. The apartment you want to have has some kind of ID, and you go to ad your address bar and uh, type immobilienscout uh, slash that ID. No, you don't do that you click on the link, because that was meant to be to direct you somewhere. And this is actually uh, the same is true for Hypermedia APIs. You go to one resource and let's say, okay, you have this resource here and I, I have something somehow related to that resource. And then you can follow that link and you somehow have, have to know what the relation it is named is about. So if you have a um, set of users like this one, and I say, okay, I have the users I just had before. That one is called Duke. And I have a link. And the link has the relation. And the relation is the interesting thing here. Because the client then only knows about the relations. It knows self has to be something um, what the object is directing to. So that user object here. Because self um, corresponds to the user directly. And you know what self is about, that this is the URL of that object and you can follow it and you will end up at the user. You will, may have five other users having a different URL. And the point is, you at that point are not longer assuming that your URLs will be constructed like they are. They, then at that point, the URLs actually doesn't matter anymore. 
It's a good thing to have like readable names like users, one, two, three, four, five, slash account, slash like, slash something. But then it doesn't matter anymore because your API is saying, okay, this is this resource here, and I have something related there, and you can follow it. Um, and this is something a bit more complicated. This is JSON in this case, but it doesn't matter actually. Um, these are books. Just imagine a name, an author, an ISBN. Availability, if you want to create something like Amazon, a bookstore, whether it's available in stock or sold out or something, a price, and links here. You again have the self link pointing to the self direction, and the point is you have an add to cart link. This would be something like on a website, you have the add to cart button on Amazon. You can click it. And the, the point is, as uh, soon as you want to add that article um, to your cart, when using your API, you have to go to some URL, you have to do something, you have to do some action, probably post something. And that adds to card relation is exactly that what, what you uh, want to have to do because your client then knows the relation, adds to card. It knows wh what adds to card is about. It doesn't know the shopping cart direction or that do some action uh, uh, resource, that doesn't matter. And, and this is also about, yeah directing the user to links. And what's more here, what it uh, gives you as well, if you say you want to add some business logic, you have that nice fancy add to cart button, but that button should in fact be only displayed if the item is in stock, or if the user has a certain credit on his account, or if the user's over 18 or something. And you don't want to have that logic in your client because then you say, okay, you want that button as well, but it should be disabled or something, and you need that business logic. And the point is that the business logic itself should only reside on the server. And what Hypermedia gives you here, something like on a website, you can direct the user, but you can all, uh, also choose whether to display this link or not. And the client should, at that point, be pretty stupid, saying only, oh, I know what add to cart relation is about, and I, lo and I know um, as soon as I have that link, then that I must display a fancy button. But it does not know anything about the status, any about, uh, anything about the business logic, and you should not, in fact, say on the client side, oh, if availability is this and user equals that. No, you say, if I have that link, I know the relation and I know what it's doing, I'm displaying that fancy button. And that, uh, that is exactly the, uh, the case. And this is an even more concrete example, because that one here first only uh, tells you where to go by add to cart button, but surely you have to know what to do in this case, because the client has to know the logic. I have to post something to somewhere. The, well, actually, the somewhere is given, the URL, but I have to post some information to that URL in order to add that article to the cart. And this is the, the point, how to do this. And this would be some more implicit logic on the client, which is up to some extent it is okay to do it that way. The next would be a, a more generic way, and this is, um, yeah, that, that's how you want to do the whole thing, how you want to implement and construct your APIs. If you do the more generic way, I will uh, explain it in a minute, then it's of course more generally applicable, but of course it's also more logic on the client, so more general re reusable logic, but also more to do. And this is why I think the reason for the uh, simple RPC style only uh, APIs are implemented in fact in projects because it's simpler um, and it's more productive, but I would say it's more short term productive because you can start up faster up front. But I think these kind of uh, example and what hypermedia is about or hypermedia gives you um, yeah, it gives you a long-term productivity and yeah, actually changes uh, in the long term are easier to do. Um, so what uh, that example is doing, it's pretty much like on a form on a website. Because uh, on a form you, you have a certain uh, set of fields and you can, um, you can fill out the fields and, and click submit. And here it also gives you, okay, what do I need here? What, actu what information do, uh, do I need? So you have the URL again. And you even have a method, so what to do post in this case. And this is some um, media type called Siren. Uh, I will explain uh, some of the uh, hypermedia media types in a minute. 
and this media type in fact gives you uh, gives you an option to add actions here and this is what an action would be this add to card relation that link uh, I showed before so this also gives you an URL and a type application JSON it could be that uh, application HTML form uh, kind of thing and the fields and the important thing here is the client then only has to know okay I know these fields I know what an ID is because I have an own model of my article, book, user, whatever, and I know what a quantity is. You may say, okay, I want to have that book twice. So it may display you uh, like a drop-down box, one, two, three, four, five for the quantity, and take the ID from its internal model, and it only has to map its internal ID to that ID, because it say, oh, I know what ID is, and it has to map the quantity. It's something... Uh, as I said, uh, the example again with the website, if you hit some website you've never seen before and it gives you a contact form and it says, okay, please fill, uh, fill out your email, please fill out your name, you know what to do. You, have, you never saw that form before, but you say, oh, name, I know what that is, and you type in your name. Of course, this can be something artificially intelligent, but up to some point that you say, okay, you tell it uh, the knowledge how to map these fields and nothing else. And everything else is just uh, applicable in a generic way and can in fact be changed and this is the important point if you change something on the server um, you don't break your clients because the uh, client uses that logic in a generic way the same way if Immobilian Scout would change something on the website you don't care because you don't look at the HTML output you just see what you got and this is, uh, this is also true here because the, uh, the logic stays the same it stays the same if some optional field, uh, field gets added, if posts uh, change to something else for some reason, if the URL gets uh, changed for some reason, and it gives you control back for the server side, because then the server is in charge of everything again. And uh, yeah, these are a collection of some of the hypermedia formats you have. Um, the point is, the website again, you are using a website using HTML, and you're not using Google's HTML, you're not using Facebook's HTML when going to Google, when going to Facebook, when going to Immobilien Scout. No, you, the browser just knows the HTML. And this is the way to go because HTML, up to some point, has some hypermedia functionality and linking functionality built in, also for forms. So you can, in fact, use it and, in fact, do something on websites even without knowing Immobilien Scout before because it's it's a more or less generally usable um, media type. And the same is true more or less for these me uh, hypermedia formats. These are more or less all, yeah, all of them in JSON, but actually it doesn't matter. Um, what you could, uh, you could have a look at all of them. They are more or less different in what they allow you. Uh, the first one, Hell, for example, does not allow you uh, what it just showed, the action. So it does not let you control what to post in this case. It does not let you introduce fields or templates, what you say, um, that you want to access some URL and it's already telling you which fields you have to use. But Siren does that, that was uh, the example just before. And another interesting thing is JSON schema, because JSON schema not only allows you to do certain actions, but also to, up to some point, define the schema itself which means you have a user and you are also defining your API what a user is about. Something like a user has a name, so what's a name? And you put that in your API as well. And this gives you another thing be, uh, uh, behind yeah, automatic discoverability that you also say it's self-documenting up to some point. The other things are also self-documenting in, in terms of how you use the API because I don't know how you documented your APIs before, but in my project there were always uh, something like, um, you have an API and then you have to post something somewhere. And then you have a users and you say, okay, when you post this, you need this field, that field, that field, and your JSON has to look like that, the structure, right? And you have these kind of URLs, you can get this URL, but you can only post that URL, and in fact how to use this. And you define a certain set of URLs and you don't do this with hypermedia, you only can, you also can say, you have something like a start page, something like a starting point service locator, or call it what you want, which says, you, okay, I have a resource users, I have a resource shopping carts, books, I don't know, 
and you hit that resource, and these are maybe only three entry points. And from there on, you navigate using that links. And yeah, JSON schema, for instance, also gives you uh, the option to, to define the schema. And then you don't even have to document the schema itself. So that's even more generally usable. You just have to implement all that logic. And that's the keyword. Let's implement something. By the way, any questions so far? You already talked. You don't have to be shy. <laughs> Everything crystal clear? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with the, the in the shopping cart URL, are you talking about uh, both? Uh, the shopping cart resource or is it uh, in, this, in this case, yes. A another resource? Mm -hmm. In this case, it was. Um, where it is, yep, there is shopping cart resource. And actually, yeah, you would put, in this case, you would not post a book rather than post something like a book selection. You only say, I want that book identified by the ID and I want it twice or three times. That's a quantity. Because you don't, in this case, would need the whole book. And this is why you can define all the feeds here specifically for that resource and say, oh, I only need the ID and the quantity on the server, so please fill that out for the client. Now you don't have the book um, resource and the, and its relation in the post body. Oh, uh, yeah. Documented Sorry, I forgot to mention. Fields, Thanks. I yes, think. you do because this uh, you see the three dots. This is included in the books resource. I will show that in a minute. It just didn't fit on the slides. You have uh, get books one two three four five, and you say uh, okay. you have a name an ISBN something else, and at the end you have links plus these actions. And this okay, is kind so of the end the of the resource. So with the fields of uh, the book, you can do this Exactly. Action. And okay. the client has to know how to map them. Okay. So for that ID, that may come from that book. But for the quantity, the client may say, OK, I have a drop down. Please select how, how many books you want. The user uh, whom the shopping cart belongs to Let's say, should it be mm -hmm. a request parameter, a query parameter? Or no, probably a session cookie. Session cookie. So this is uh, mostly uh, done you with that, or you're using OAuth or something. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's that's the way to go. But it should be uh, kind of uh, yeah, stateless in, in terms of that you don't uh, store it and pass it back and forth. You mm. probably use a session cookie, I would say. This is mostly, mostly used for this. Okay. Um, I wonder how many times you are using JSON schema in your in real world projects. In your real world projects, never, never. Also not Siren. This is um, we used the the link example something like this once that we say okay. Uh, this is what I want to say. Y you also have to have to uh, yeah yeah know is it worth it to to introduce that kind of generic way? You have to know the pros and cons. It definitely gives you pros to. Um, yeah, be more self, self uh, documenting and self exploring the, the API actually, and it gives you a long term productness, uh, productiveness. I would say. So I would argue if you have a really big project and a really big API consumed by really a lot of clients, then it pays off. It totally pays off. And if you don't have this, if you only have two clients, then it's totally fine to, to do it that way, kind of, that you say, okay, you introduce links, and you know what the links are about, and you have a possibility to control more or less the business logic by using the links and, and telling the, the client where to go. Um, this is fine as well. It, it really depends on what you're doing. Depends on your project. And the point is about that uh, RPC-style APIs, because I see them all over again every time. Um, it's perfectly fine to do it that way, to let them communicate over HTTP using some words, uh, verbs, using some remote procedure calls or something, but please then don't call it REST. It's totally fine to do it that way, to say, okay, I only have one server, one client, it's totally fine, but don't call it that way because you're yeah, confusing other developers because they may assume that this what they are doing is REST just because they use HTTP. Oh, SOAP also uses HTTP, yeah, you know? So the, that's kind of the story, but it always uh, depends. Anybody else? All right. So. 
Um, the session title is about JuxRS. So I want to show you how to implement all these nice examples using Java EE technology. Um, because uh, for Spring, you can already do something like this, uh, introducing links programmatically. And you certainly can do this in Java EE as well, but it's not used that much in real, uh, real world projects. And this is what I, why I want to show this a bit more, what you can do using JuxRS and plain Java EE 7. Or actually, with, with several diff different approaches and what's what's there. So we just um, create a simple oops, um, hypermedia test, a simple J7 project. This is a Maven build. It's just an archetype which creates something because I'm too lazy. And you have PowerMaximal in the source, and we will just open that using IntelliJ because IntelliJ is cool. Yep. So, um, this is just newly created project um, using the Maven, hello, Maven build. It's, it takes a while. It's basically empty except the JuxRS configuration, which is just the JuxRS activator. So it's basically empty. Um, let's introduce something. Let's introduce a resource. I showed the books example, so I'll just uh, stick with books if that's okay for you. Um, this is a stateless, if I could spell. JuxRS uh, resource saying books. And you want to, to get a list of books in this case. So that would uh, correspond to that example, but using JSON in this case. We could also do XML, actually it doesn't matter. So um, yeah, the first thing I want to show you is, yeah, le let's do this first. Um, we have a list of books, and the book, in fact, is, is just a model. It said uh, what we had, we, we had an ID, we had a name, right, we uh, had an author, and yeah, probably a price. By the way, floating point precisions don't do pro money calculations in real world, right? Okay. All right, generate getters and setters, and just for convenience, up constructors. Oops, just a simple pojo, nothing special. All right, list, yep, get books. So you want just to uh, display a set of books. And now you want to return the books, and of course we're using um, some EJB inject something, let's call that bookstore. She doesn't matter, and you say, okay, bookstore, please give me, give me the books. Oops. Actually, it doesn't know that. Bookstore. This is another EJB. Doing nothing special, just returning books. It says, okay, um, just give me a list of a new book here with one name Java, author Duke, and a price, let's say, 29.29. And another book. Um, 9.99. All right. Simple. And you're returning that list. And as well, you're returning a single book using the ID. But this is the point, the client shouldn't know this. The client shouldn't know how to construct these URLs. Get book by the ID. Um, you're using the path parameter to identify it. 
should be clear. Any questions so far? This is just uh, plain JuxRS. Should be yeah, simple. Yeah, okay. Method get book. Yep, yep, yep. And return a new book. Use that ID. Java Duke. That's fine. All right. That example is uh, really sh simple. I won't even run this because it should be obvious. It's uh, returning that book in this case using the information. But actually, it's boring. You don't. You want to have uh, the link as well. So there, and the corresponding JSON um, thing as well. So you're adding up a map, actually string to URI saying, OK, these are the links, the links you want to have. And as well, you want, well, you want to change the name, how it is in the JSON. You may wonder, XML, uh, JAXB annotations also work for most of the JSON implementations. So if you have JAXON, you can also use this. You don't need any third-party dependencies in your project. This is really nice because I want to have it starting with underscore links and I don't want to have that in my response, the ID. I only want name, author, price and the links. And now, the thing is how to add the links because you only have your business objects here, the books, and the books doesn't, uh, doesn't know about the links you want to have because that's, that's part of something else. It could be part of some other business logic saying, OK, I want the add to cart link here, but not there, something. Because you say, oh, you don't want the links here. You only maybe want to have the self link in that response, but may want to have the add to cart button in this response, which means um, we can use fancy streams for this books. Actually, let's do it another way. Um, books stream, saying okay for uh, for each book. Do something, and then book you have the links. If I would not forget to add the getter and setter. Where am I? Here. Get links and put put something like self and then add the UR, uh, URL. And this is where the interesting point comes in, where JuxRS really helps you. You have something like URI info, and you can inject that using add context. Because context, with that you can inject several context objects related to JuxRS. For example, URI info. And that URI info provides some functionality to create, well, URIs using the current request object. And that gives you certain uh, information. I will show that in a minute. And you can say something like um, URI create a variable, URI, yep, is URI info and saying, OK, get base URI builder. Explain in a minute what base is about. And you can say, oh, give me a path from actually from my JuxRS resource because I don't want to um, repeat myself all over again. I have user, sorry, books, books slash one, two, three, four, five, and I don't want uh, to have, uh, and I don't want to have several points where I specify books slash one, two, three, four, five. You, you want to have the knowledge how you construct the URLs in one central place. And this is why you can use the URI builders here. You say, okay, give me the path of that resource, books resource in that case, that will give you exactly this one. Plus, in this case, uh, give me the path of the books resource and the method calling called get book, because the get book method gives you the path of a path of that. And everything you specify here has to be a JuxRS resource. And a JuxRS resource, in terms of the specification, is um, the method here, or actually anything annotated with add path, which can give you the concatenated paths at the end. 
And you can see, okay, fine, I have books slash some ID. I don't want the ID, I want the actual ID. And this is why when you construct the URI, uh, URI you can do some parameter substitution, saying, okay, that shouldn't be a squirrely bracket ID, that should be the actual ID. And the ID comes from, in this case, the book, and that doesn't work anymore because we're not in that, oops. We not in that lambda expression. Let's split that up. And what do you have here? Book get links. Where does that came from? Book get ID. Right. So you have the path from here, the path from there, and the ID to substitute the URI. And that one is actually, yeah, that's the that's the thing, let's, for, just for clarity, split that up. You have the URI constructed here. Say URI to, uh, no, not to string, it's a URI. And that's pretty much it. And then for every book, you edit that link. And then, simple. You could also say um, constructed even further return book and then say okay you have hello return oh sorry not for each rather than map and then go on go on further with your stream collections to list and just return that directly so that's a cooler java 8 feature if you want to do some kind of this um, so what we, we have here, we have the AJB. We fetch all the books, put a stream uh, around that. We map all the books to the self, uh, to the books themselves, plus adding a new constructed URI to construct the self link here, using JaxRS technology to construct a URI. And this works for get books. And the same is true for the get book. Um, resource itself, we actually can, we would just copy paste here for the sake of the example. Um, for the real world examples, you want to introduce um, either some other CDI compu component, construct the URIs just for you, or, um, or a private method or something like uh, that. All right, get books, get book from the ID, and then yeah, actually we can't use that. That was stupid. Um, get books, it is the book, and then we say, oh, that's a URI, that's fine, book, and that's book as well, as well. and then oops, return the book, and that's pretty much it. You construct the book, you have one book, you take the, link of, uh, the links of that book resource, saying, okay, you put the self URI, oh, and I want to have that add to card URI as well. So you can add something like add to cart and then add something else. Oops, doing this and doing that, add to cart and say, okay, for the uh, sake of the example, we can do something else here, but it should be another resource. Oh, actually, we can we can add it. It doesn't matter. Something like card resource. We want to don't want to add some business logic here, but it actually only has to be a valid JaxRS resource. Um, shopping cart. We had I think it was shopping cart, and that's it. Can be empty. And saying okay, path out of this and delete all that here, except the build. There, so you get the path of that resource here, which is in fact the shopping cart name here. And you add it up to your links. So hopefully that worked. We would just build it using Maven, just a default Maven clean install because we just have a default, default Maven project and it's even faster than I can talk. And we will just deploy that on Wildfly. It just takes the Wildfly, depo uh, deploys it to a Wildfly 9, I think it is. And, um, all right, 
everything looks fine and if you fire up a hello a rest client of your choice you can say a postman something like this hello say another example hypermedia test of course i prepared something saying all right you have all the resources here of that books saying okay java do price something and links you have links here self that your client knows about the relation knows oh i want to have exactly this book so i click on it yep that's another thing because what did i forget to add i forget i forgot to add producers application json so it does that automatically for you so it assumes that it always is application j application json or you add a uh, content type so come on explicitly saying oops what are you doing here saying application json come on I want to go on my nose and send that thing oh sorry accept content type would be the other way around if the client sends something because that's normally what you have to do here but this is um, accept so what the client uh, wants to accept here because rest again you can exchange different uh, things you can exchange JSON XML whatever you like a, a format of yourself siren JSON schema what nobody does <laughs> and yeah this one that's postman that Postman, yeah, like a postman. It's a Chrome, uh, Chrome extension. But you can even use a command line. It actually doesn't matter. It's just HTTP. And yeah, you see the add to cart link as well. And this is only on that resource. You didn't see it on the books. And this is what we, what we did for real, life, uh, real world projects. So having that kind of uh, response here. And then the client would have to know, okay, I know add to cart, and I somehow know what add to cart expects me to do. And then at least you have some, uh, some kind of self-exploring um, knowledge. And what's else really cool at uh, JuxRS, at the URI info functionality I showed you, it uses um, information of the current request, which means if the user, of course, does not access localhost, but accesses something else, um, I've piped that local domain to localhost and say, oh, of course you wanted to access that domain originally. If you say you mostly have some Apache or Nginx proxy and that URL of the, oh, actually the domain of, or the host name of that proxy is it's accessed by your user, not your local host 8080 something. And then the request checks that and say, okay, you, of course, you get the URI back from the original response here, coming from that request, which was originally requested. So this is, yeah, any questions so far? Yeah. So just uh, wondering how the shopping cart resource knows which book you want to add. Is yeah, yeah, you would um, have to have to go provide some information, like the ID you okay. did before. And this would be just the param parameter, and how would it define in which way? Yeah, this is exactly the point. You would have to document it. Because on this example, this was a simple example, only adding some links. The other okay. example would just follow in a minute, but okay. using okay. that siren approach. Okay. That would just uh, come in a minute. But you're right, and this is exactly the point. In this uh, approach, you don't know it, because yeah. the, the client has to know it, and this is okay. some kind of implicit logic, and this is in terms of hypermedia, it's, it's bad because yeah, okay. you have to yeah. tell the client explicitly. Thanks. Yep. Anything else so far? Uh, yep. Uh, I have so from the slides, I understood that actually the actions would be part of this resource. Mm -hmm. I mean, now you haven't implemented it yet, but yep. that's the idea to add the actions to this uh, book resource um, um, uh, and the fields. Yeah. To yeah, that will come in a minute. Yeah, for that example, okay. that's uh, what he was asking as well. He doesn't know the fields and he doesn't know the actions, right? He only has the URI. And you would have to know that this would be a post to add the, to card. And okay. this is the point. You have to document this as well. Okay. Totally right. <laughs> Give her a key as well <laughs> for that good question. 
Everything else? All right, that's, let's move on. That was the, okay. That was the simple example here. And I will just, uh, just for the sake of the time, code that example again using a different approach. Because uh, this was uh, pretty much like using POJOs and using Jack's B technology to control everything. Actually, you, we just controlled that uh, the links should be uh, underscore links and uh, something else. But you may have a more complex example where that doesn't map to your POJOs anymore. Or you don't want to introduce 20 different POJOs for 20 different um, resource representations you probably have in a bigger API, right? So you want more, you want more control over this. And yeah, so let's delete everything again and write it from scratch. So get, and now you have something like a JSON array. This is, you probably know it, this is JSONP. JSONP API introduced in Java E7. So if you have a Java E7 project, you can already use it out of the box. Uh, the, your implementation has to support it. Get books using the JSON array. And you can um, have a builder like, build a pattern like uh, API to construct these JSON arrays, in fact. You say, oh, create array builder, and then you add, 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 something here. But we don't um, do this right now. We say, OK, bookstore, get me the books, please. And then map, oh, sorry, stream, and then map my books to, yeah, let's map them. We will map the books to a JSON object. This corresponds uh, to the JSON array. We also have a JSON object. And the JSON object should be um, created programmatically, so dynamically maybe depending on your use case, depending on your business logic. So you say JSON create object builder, which will in fact create you an object. Say add, okay, we want to have the name here. The name comes from book get name probably, and we want to do something uh, something else. Uh, oops. I'm locked here. Oops. Add a name, add an author. Actually, that's boring. We will shortcut it. Um, add maybe links. And add. That's getting. That's getting uh, too much. Oops. You add that here using this approach. Using that, JSON, and these are just the links. We can do this all nested, but there will be nobody will uh, be able to read that. Uh, create object builder. This is just the links. Everything uh, the same we, like we did before. And you say, okay, add add me the link um, called self and some URI in this case. Um, yeah, we can do the URI info. Won't take too long. Get base URI builder. Oh, I forgot to mention that base URI builder was exactly the why I could uh, wrote that other domain and it took the other domain because base URI base builder tells it, okay, construct the URI based on that base URI uh, corresponding to the current request. So w if some server was requested in some port, it, start with, uh, it starts with that port with your current um, application context plus your JAXRS application path and everything else. Um, Path of that resource, books, resource, class, and the path of the method, books, resource. And you already see, you probably want to uh, outsource this and, uh, that into a specific uh, functionality. So you build that using the book get ID, and then you say, um, okay, to string, because that JSON API. Um, unless uh, the JAXB does, does not know URIs, you would have to tell them by plain text string, but, uh, but you just can fire dot to string and it will work. So we have the nested links and we add the nested links here. You say, okay, something like uh, build, build me the JSON object and we return that in our Lambda. So that book we had here in the stream gets mapped into the corresponding JSON object which is name, author, and links, creating that link. And that will be um, collected to a JSON array. 
And there's a corresponding method, create array builder. And we'll use that using super cool Java 8 technology, create builder, JSON array builder, add JSON array builder, add return. Yeah, it doesn't know this JSON array builder. No, we messed up somewhere. JSON create builder. I think that was wrong. What do we have here? We have a JSON object. And this is probably um, the issue with uh, using too many lambdas. You sooner or later get lost, <laughs> right? Uh, collect JSON create array builder. JSON array builder add. JSON array builder add. Documentation found, it's uh, probably lost somewhere. What always helps in this case, this is actually a good example to, IntelliJ helps you here, to extract a variable and then you say, oh, what do I have here? I have a stream out of JSON objects. And then I could use the stream. Actually, I'm not sure what the problem is here. I, JSON create object builder, create array builder. Um, it will give you an array builder. Ah, I know what the problem is. You have to say build, because otherwise you would have a JSON array builder. Um, yeah, live demo. And with the dot build, you get a JSON array, actually, out of the JSON array builder. Yeah, obviously. You can revoke that again and say, okay, I want to use this. Create a JSON array builder, add it, add it, and then you're done. Build, and then you have a JSON array using this. Questions? Could you follow? Good. Yeah. Uh, I cannot, uh, is this kind of case uh, why I have to add twice uh, the signature? Is not um, th that's the signature of the collect thing. You have actually, um, yeah, how can I explain it in a simple way? You, ha you have a, a an, an object, a type in your stream. So that's a stream of JSON objects in this case. And you're, um, creating an intermediate object to combine these. This is, in this case, a JSON array builder. And using the fork join mechanism, you may have several um, JSON array builders, and they should add up together you, to make one out of two. And also, m you may have one JSON array builder and one JSON object already. And to include that JSON object, you need another method. Hmm. And fortunately or unfortunately, these two methods are the same. One method is add the JSON value, the JSON object in this case, and the other thing is add a whole JSON array builder. Oh, okay. And they are the same, like put and put all for a map, and add and add all for a collection. Okay. Yes. So you could think of add and add all, but it's named the same for JSONP. So the second one adds up uh, several array builders, that's why it's uh, twice here. Good question. Anything else? Don't be shy. All right, let's move on. Get and uh, what we just had before path uh, ID. I shouldn't have deleted it. JSON array get book out of the path param ID. That's long ID. Blah blah. Return bookstore. Get books book from the ID. And then obviously um, you have a book. Say, oh, I don't want to have the, uh, oops, nobody complained, you are not paying attention. JSON object. <laughs> JSON create object builder, add just the same things we, ha we had down here, add this and add that. Book in this case, book and these links, yeah, well, we construct them here, oops. Actually, we can use this as well. Just copy paste programming as always. Self get book. That's a uh, book. And the same is true for um, where are we? At self and at the end before the build at the adds to cart functionality. And we probably want to do some um, variables here, add to cart, 
that's uh, the card resource again and that's it build without the ID we don't need it here card resource and that's the add to card and that will be included here so you have the two URIs you have the nested JSON and now you have the JSON object and that gets returned everything clear basically the same like before just using JSONP and that what that gets you I will show you in a minute let's kill this again let's rebuild it it was the Maven clean install would take another two seconds and let's deploy it again yep see, sounds good we will fire up our um, this client again and you see nothing changed still works as it should be um, why did I show you this because um, for the sake of the time I will not show you a complete siren example I will show you just uh, the slides what we had here um, oops. I would encourage you to have a look at the space uh, specification or actually I could show you um, something else an hypermedia juxtarest hypermedia test um, project I have on github github you can check it out I will display the link in a minute um, but actually, y you get the story, right? You have the JSON uh, array functional, uh, JSON P functionality, and you can construct your JSON object in a programmatic way. So you can basically do what you want, and you can, in fact, um, create such an example just using programmatic ap approaches, which is really helpful. What else is there? And this is why I, in fact, uh, want to show you this here, GitHub. That's the one. This is a simple example I just created. It's also a bookstore, slightly different book example, but it has similar things. And this is more or less full Siren example. So Siren has a lot more than with a lot of relations and what, what the class is and I have some entities and what they're about. That's way too much to cover here, but you get, uh, you get a feeling for it. So what a hypermedia API using such an approach could look like. This is, uh, it's called Jamison, so like a bookstore, right? And what, is, what I want to show you here is just the functionality because it's faster to show it here. Because I told you there is a programmatic approach using JSONP, but there is, of course, also framework, sign for j And it gives you two options. Either you do it in also a programmatic way, which I would do. Um, with, of course, predefined method, uh, methods. So you say, uh, construct an entity for me and add an action. And that action, of course, has a um, URL, has a type, has a method, an HTTP method, and so on and so forth. And it already has a pre-built uh, builder pattern just for you that you get it right. It's a bit more uh, productive to do it that way. But of course, you get a third-party dependency in your, in your project. So depending on what you like. Of course, if you would build a bigger API, then you surely would want to introduce some functionality yourself. And you could um, do something like that third-party dependency does for yourself, your, for your project, because then you save up a bit for third-party dependencies, which is always a good thing to have a small WAR file and to have at least dependencies as possible. And it also gives you a second thing. I don't want to talk about that too long. It um, can, like JAXB or uh, JSON, um, Jackson annotations give you control some entities using annotations that you what I just did before create a POJO saying I have a name and author and so on and so forth and it automatically inserts some action using some annotation and reflection mechanism but I don't like it too much why um, because it gives you to not enough control because you probably for an API want to modify some things here and there and it doesn't fit anymore or doesn't fit for all examples and then we, you have to do it programmatically anyway so I would just encourage you to or not encourage but you should yeah, consider w what makes sense in this case and probably with a programmatic approach yeah um, you can have the link as Dashna Juxa or as Hypermedia that's just a um, yeah, small example it also has some kind of simple example um, using that JSONP API and also using something called JSONB. That's yeah, 
the same thing what JuxB is for XML will be for JSON. It is, will be introduced in JEE 8, so I don't want to talk about this because it's Java 7, because it should be real world, right? But you can check it out to, uh, to get a feeling for a more fully flat, uh, fledged example than I showed here. And did I show it? Yes, I showed that. So just for you to get the story, what is possible? What is possible using JuxRS? What does JuxRS offer you, uh, offer me? To, um, yeah, to construct URLs for this example, and what options do I have to um, construct yeah, such hypermedia APIs? Any questions? That's either a good or a bad sign. Are there any kind of client libraries you use or recommend to um, interpret this, for example, siren uh -huh. structure? I, mean, I, I, I can think about for the client, this uh, can be quite uh, troubling, yep. all this uh, yeah, <laughs> extra yeah. data, especially if you yes, think about they are, uh, mobile yes, clients. Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. For, for Zyme, for example, is a Java client exam, uh, example. I didn't try it out too much, to be honest, so I can't tell you too much about that, but sure. There, there have to, has to be some, some client logic Im, uh, implementing that. And if you're using a hypermedia API in a bigger fashion, you always have the same logic, right? So it pays off really fast. As you say, you, you need some kind of logic to access that. And the second thing, you need some kind of business logic only for the smaller pieces, for, the, for removing parts, actually. So how to map this to that, and so on and so forth. And yeah, of course, but it pays off to have that yeah, functionality accessed in the same way. Yeah, good question. Something else? Yep. Over there. Um, could you um, just show uh -huh. um, how you would handle um, the return type? So hypermedia allows to return... JSON or something JSON else? JSON yeah, sure. or um, HTML or something yep, like that? That's done using producers. Don't mix it up with the CDI producers, check the JuxRS producers in this case. And you either type something or you say um, media type. There are already some built in for uh, JuxRS and for some reason that never gets auto completed. You can say application JSON in this case. It will be application slash JSON. Or of course you could invent your own if you invent your own hypermedia content type, I, sh I showed you a few, uh, or take Siren, and uh, I think it's JSON plus Siren something, and that will be added here. And the same is true for consumes. That corresponds to um, the things you, you consume, yeah. so everything the user posts to this. If you look at uh, the GitHub project, I, I also have a fully fledged example where you post actually that book to uh, the cart. So you can look that up, how, that, how it is done here, and uh, yeah, you would have to do such things. And this also can be done on the method level. Yeah. So either, yeah. Oh, as always. Just one clarifying question. Yeah. Uh, the If you return a JSON object, it uh -huh. will be still JSON. It will not be yes, converted to XML or something like that. Exactly. This is the only uh, exception to your question. If you have this part of the spec, if you have JSON P, something returned from your JuxRS resource, the, it's implicitly JSON because everything else wouldn't make sense. So that's part of the spec. If the implementation supports JSON B, it has JSON P, it has to be JSON in this case. Questions so far? And I would say we pretty much exactly reached an hour. Very good. Um, Thanks a lot for your attention. Hope you like it. Okay, so we have we have even more giveaways. Can you hold yep, up the sure, book there? Sure. <laughs> no, don't look at the shiny one, look at the book. Ask him. It's his book. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how late do you want to go for the Raspberry Pi portion? Oh, sorry. 
Just tell me, tell me when you want to end, and I'll. Oh yeah, we we have a. I think this is actually more interesting than me.
comes a new challenger! Friend, thank you. <laughs> okay, we fixed the sound issue, hopefully. Um, so it's actually really hard to do this um, multi-threaded work to get all this stuff working and synchronizing properly. Um, but you know, the hardest the hardest part is actually doing all the testing. So you know, you have to play you have to play a lot of video games. Anybody recognize this guy? One of the one of the top Five hardest video games ever. Um, Ninja Gaiden. I think I think I had to leave my console on for two weeks because you can't. Once you die, you can't. Um, it doesn't remember. You have to actually restart over. Mega Man. Mega Man One was actually the hardest one. Um, flying games. This actually is a Super NES game, not an NES game, but you get the idea. And after this, you you reach Nirvana. You understand like this is the Nirvana of gaming. So who know who knows what this code is? Come on, somebody must know. You, you can't, you can't play, man. Who, who knows? <laughs> who knows what this magical code does, or what it's called? Anybody? So this is the Konami code. So if you ever play Contra, or like any of the Konami shooter games, this is your infinite live code, cheat, power up, etc. Um, and this is this is how you actually beat these games. So what I'm actually going to talk about is this little 3D printed console. So um, this is somewhere. Who's you know, you're still playing it? You mind maybe passing it around? <laughs> you can finish your stage if you like first. Um, so this this is a 3D printed um, gaming device. It's runs a software stack that's entirely Java. So it's using a Java-based game emulator. Um, I did all the models for the 3D case, all the 3D cases, custom designed. And it runs with a Raspberry Pi inside of it. Um, so it uses a Raspberry Pi too. Um, and we're going we're gonna to kind of walk through a little bit about the electronics and the software and then the 3D printing process. Um, and then you guys can ask questions as we go along. We, we've learned asking questions gets you stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> ask questions often. Um, if, if folks ask questions, when you can hand them the mic, Sebastian, you have to flip the first button on the camera. Um, let me show you. This, this button right here, flip it to channel one. And that turns the mic on. Um, so when you flip that, then I'm on channel one, the mic is on channel two. When you put it back up, I'm on channels one and two. Um, okay, so using a Raspberry Pi 2. How many folks have a Raspberry Pi? Ah, very good. So we have lots of geeks. Everybody else has no excuse to not go out and get the latest Raspberry Pi. Who knows what the latest Raspberry Pi is? Yeah. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yes, yeah, so the Raspberry Pi 3 is, is really cool. Um, they put in a faster processor. They put in a Wi-Fi and Bluetooth module. The GPU is also what goes at a faster frame rate. So overall, it's just like a big upgrade. And it's entirely backwards compatible with the one and the two, um, which is awesome. Anybody know what these two ports are for on top of the Raspberry Pi? Yeah, yeah. OK, tell us. 
Okay, so I'll repeat what he's saying. But one's for the display, and the other one's for, for the camera. Yeah, very good. Um, okay, so I think I think that answer. Well, we'll we'll do it at the end. Okay, so um, that's correct. And actually, the display is one of the challenges here. Um, you can give out prizes along the way whenever somebody answers a question. So toss some prizes at the audience. Um, so when you're trying to figure out a display, the Raspberry Pi Foundation put out a camera, and they also put out a display. So the the display is nice, but it's big. It's like a seven-inch monster with this huge metal back blade, and it's heavy, and it's awkward to use. So what I did for this case is I put in a really tiny LCD display. It's um, 4.3 inches across. And here are the different options you have for um, doing displays on the Raspberry Pi. Um, you can use the built-in port, which I mentioned, which has the limitation that there's only one screen in the world which works with it. You can use the composite port. Um, the composite port is like your standard analog TV, which actually the old video game systems, that's the only way they supported displaying it. But in general, the um, when you're converting from composite to an LCD display, it doesn't look that great. Um, HDMI looks better, but both the composite and the HDMI consume quite a lot of power because you have to convert from a, a digital signal to the interface and then back from the interface to the LCD interface. You're kind of converting in a round circle. Um, SPI is a clever trick you can play. There's some LCD panels which natively talk SPI, which is a, a serial interface, a high-speed serial interface. The problem with SPI is it's high speed, but it's not very high speed. So you get about 15 frames per second which is not that good. Does anyone know how many frames per second the classic Nintendo games ran at? Sixty. Because it's interlaced. <laughs> so the, the classic, actually, that's not entirely true. So it's 60 in the US, 50 in Europe because of PAL. So what you're doing, NTSC was 60 frames per second interlaced. So it's actually 30 frames per second. Um, PAL is, the, uh, is 50 slash 25. So yeah, so 15 is not going to cut it. And um, you can also use this funky thing called the device tree. So the device tree is a little hack you can do in the Raspberry Pi where you can reallocate the GPIO pins to do different things. And so you can actually upload a new device tree file to the boot, the boot section. It remaps all the GPIO pins. Um, you can use a little cute little board like this, the Adafruit Kippa, to take the GPIO pins and then map them onto LCD pins and use a standard LCD cable. And then you magically get um, LCD screens at full refresh rate that the Pi supports, like a normal graphics display. It operates almost the same as HDMI. And it's fully powered off the Raspberry Pi as well, with one limitation. Well, one big limitation. After you've done remapping your pins, you only have six GPIO pins left, and none of them are the interesting pins. So you don't get serial, you don't get I squared C, you don't get um, SPI, you get like nothing interesting. You just get plain on off GPIO pins. So in this, if you look at the, the hardware, it's actually using GPIO for the keyboard for the buttons, sorry, did I, did I, did I mess you up? And <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Mm, bottom right. Oh, and also, you can use the camera and take pictures while I'm presenting as well. Same thing, push the back button to focus. Um, all right, so count with me. How many buttons do we have? One, two, three, four. Five, six, oops. Okay, so six GPIO pins aren't enough. So this is a this is a major fail. Does anyone remember the the, the ending message when you when you beat Mario? When you beat a, a castle of Mario, what does it tell you? So when my daughter saw this when she was playing, she's um she's eleven now? Twelve? Twelve. <laughs> She gets quite upset because I never know her age. So she, she was extremely upset that um, unlike modern games where you every time you make an achievement, there's like 
fireworks and applause and lots of positive gratification. In classic video games, they would egg you on. They would, they would kill you. They would give you mean messages like this. It was horrible. And so this is, this is how I felt after I realized that I'd, I'd done a design and I couldn't actually get a working keyboard on it. So does anyone have any ideas on how you could technically solve this? How can you how can you use six GPIO pins to to control a full multiplex. multiplex multiplex yeah so that's actually an excellent answer that's how keyboards work so your your standard you know keyboard operates off a lot less than hundreds of hundreds of pins right and the way it works is it uses um, multiplexing where it has rows and columns and then it it um, sends signals along the columns and then it listens on the rows and it can it can scan the matrix and figure out which keys are on and off so that's great it's a lot of wiring and a lot of trouble so I didn't want to do that I cheated and I used some diodes on the start and select buttons so when you press start it actually presses left and right simultaneously and you press select it presses up and down simultaneously and those motions are not not allowable, right? Pressing left and right simultaneously or pressing up and down simultaneously. Um, so this seems like a wonderful solution. There is, there is one corner case, which um, my buddy Andrew, who wrote the emulator, pointed out to me that th there, there are some NES games, while you can't press left and right simultaneously, you press like a directional arrow and start or select simultaneously. And one of the examples he had was Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. For some of the special moves, you had to like press directional arrows and start or select simultaneously. So I broke one, at least one game. <laughs> but it works, it works pretty well, and it's a lot less wiring. You just need you know, four diodes, two for each of the start and select buttons. And the diodes do kind of current protection, so they, you know, you're not just wiring all the pins so they all press simultaneously. Um, it controls current to only flow one direction, and this allows you to do start and select buttons. So here's my messy, my messy wiring, um, showing the Kippa map to a breadboard. And my first, my first um, gamepad was actually a breadboard with buttons on it wired up kind of like this, um, where I soldered all the stuff to the, the Kippa, and then I connected the wires. Um, I would highly recommend not doing this, put heat shrink tubing around each of these. So I later fixed this. I actually added heat shrink so they don't electrically touch when you're accidental. And this is a bare bones, minimal working set of electronics hardware um, that you can actually play games on. So if you have a Raspberry Pi, for everyone who raised their hand and said they had a Raspberry Pi, you can, you can go home and you can build this. I have all the code on GitHub, and I have all the instructions posted. Um, and you just have to find some buttons and wire. Super easy. And you have a working game emulator. For everyone else, $35 for Raspberry Pi. Get the Raspberry Pi 3. <laughs> Put your name on the waiting list. It'll be worth it. A Raspberry Pi Zero is cool as well. You should get that one. I think the Raspberry Pi Zero is maybe more available now. Still out of, still out of stock? Yeah. Anyway, they'll eventually get over the um, sold out. OK, so software. Emulator. So I mentioned a couple times, this actually uses um, an NES emulator entirely written in Java. Andrew Hoffman, who's a really cool guy, um, works at the University of Los Angeles, wrote the emulator. Um, you can run it on the Raspberry Pi just by doing a remote debugging session like this. Um, so you set up a remote platform inside of NetBeans to deploy to the Raspberry Pi. If you haven't used this feature for like writing Java code, it's really cute because it lets you like use profiling and debug points and all the the standard features you'd want from um, remote execution. And then this is what the run dialog looks like, where you um you set up your um, project to run on device. And the most of this is normal. The only thing funky I did was um. I have a native library path. That, that's not what I want to do. I have a native library path, and the native library path is there, so you can use JInput, which is a library for USB um, keyboards. So you could plug up a USB keyboard to this guy, and you could actually game with a little USB keyboard if you wanted to as well. 
but you can actually leave that off and just you know execute it normally. And then you have working games on the Raspberry Pi. So, minor pitch. What do you think the frame rate is <laughs> of Java, the, his emulator running on the Raspberry Pi? Out of the box. Okay. Anyone want to guess? 10. Lower. <laughs> Yeah, so it was about it was about six, I think, when I first unboxed it and took it out. But you know, it's he he designed it for desktop systems, so he actually never ran it. He never tried to tune it for um, Raspberry Pi. And um, I went through with the profiler and found lots of low hanging fruit. Um, here's some of the low hang hanging fruit which I found. So um, the swing video was a big issue. That's a bottleneck because um, it has to go through X windows. And then it has to um, go through like a lot of conversions for like different buffers, double buffering. Um, if you use JavaFX instead, so I, I ported his code to run on JavaFX, that's like, you know, easily the graphics pipeline went from being the, the number one bottleneck to, you know, maybe like, a, I think it's currently like maybe like 15% per frame of the, the load. Um, the synchronization between the CPU, PPU, and the APU were also a huge issue, but I reverted back to an older version of his code base, which rather than rendering things per pixel, it renders things per line. So it's slightly less accurate, but it's much, much, much faster. Um, so that makes a big difference on the Raspberry Pi. It's technically more accurate to do pixel by pixel, and there's certain games by, I think there's a UK company, Code something masters, I can't remember. But they, all the games they produce are horrible <laughs> um, from an emulation standpoint because they do a lot of tricky things. Um, he had bitwise helper functions everywhere in the code, and this was actually the number one speed up because the way he did the bitwise helper functions, they couldn't be inlined. Um, so all of those calls everywhere to the helper functions were eating up a lot of performance. I extracted a bunch of PPU operations. I replaced APU double math with longs. I tried replacing array access via unsafe, and this didn't actually help. Does anyone know what unsafe is? Yeah. Yeah, so um, unsafe, you can use it for a bunch of stuff, but the unsafe APIs are things you're not supposed to use. And they allow you to do direct memory access, which means you can get around the garbage collector, you can get around like array bounds checks. There's all sorts of like, Java language things you can bypass. Unfortunately, the Java compiler and the JIT in particular is really good at tuning this stuff. So in a lot of cases, you're actually optimizing things which have already been optimized. So I mean, the performance was identical on the large array operations. Basically, it stores the game cartridges as a big array in memory. And it keeps scanning around for memory. It keeps writing to the memory to then do registers. It's, it's quite a lot of array access, but it didn't help. This one actually didn't help either, the system replacing loops with system array copy because that's now an intrinsic, so it automatically does that. Um, pulse width modulation was another thing which helped a lot. So on the Raspberry Pi, it uses pulse width modulation for doing audio, and whenever you flush the audio buffer, there's a delay. So this is causing delays in the application, even because the, the way it works is every frame it would, it would give audio for sound effects and music. Um, the, the music doesn't really matter, the speed it runs at. The sound effects are more important, that they're responsive. So by reducing it to sending, flushing the audio buffer like once every three or four frames, you're slightly delaying some of the sound effects. Um, it's not noticeable um, when you're playing. But you're speeding up, you're getting a big performance gain because you're not flushing the buffer as, as often. If you slow it down more than that though, you'll actually notice the audio lag. Okay, so last thing, 3D printing the case. Any, any questions so far on electronics or software? Okay, well, you, you still have time to ask. So for 3D printing, the, the case that's going around, where's the case now? Okay, who, who hasn't seen the case? Okay, pass it over there. Um, so the, the case is actually 3D printed on this guy, the Ultimaker 2. Um, they, now have, they now have a newer version of the Ultimaker 2 with an improved print head. 
Um, I forget what they call it, Ultimaker 2 something. Um, and I, the reason I like this printer, we have a bunch of different printers we've, we've bought from the Java demo team to do different demos for Java 1 or other conferences we do. Um, and we have like a, a MakerBot, some Affinia printers, the Ultimakers. And um, the MakerBots um, ne are never working. And the problem is when something breaks on them, you have to ship it back to the manufacturer because it's, it's a supported product. And like even the extruder, you can't take it apart and fix it when you jam plastic in it. So it could be user error, but you still have to ship it back in and get it fixed by them, which is a big pain since it's proprietary. Um, the Affinity printers are fine, but they're, they're kind of, I think their production level printers are much nicer. Their home printers are, they're workhorses, but they're also very feature light. Um, the Ultimaker is a good one because it's um, open source firmware and open source hardware, and they also have a bunch of tools like Cura, which are open source. Um, originally, the, the Ultimaker 1 was a kit you just put together yourself. Um, but the newer models, the two, and the, the latest one, they give it to you pre-assembled, but you can still tear it down and reassemble it, and there's lots of mods out there for it. Um, but if you're looking for a, like a 3D printer or something like it, I'd recommend finding something which a, it has an open platform, and B, has a large community around it. And there's, there's a few different companies which meet this criteria, so, you know, don't, don't go with somebody who's proprietary or you'll regret it. Um, and then for modeling, I used um, a software called Fusion 360 from Autodesk. Um, it's kind of like SketchUp if you use SketchUp, but it's better for this purpose. And they have a free... Uh, startup and hobbyist license and a free student license. So if you're not using it, you know, to make professional stuff, like, you know, some people actually every day they go to the office, they do their 3D modeling, and that's their job is to do 3D modeling of, um, of real objects, real world objects, then it makes sense to spend thousands of dollars on licenses for software. Um, if you're a hobbyist like me who, like, does one project a year, maybe like, you know, weekends, weekends and evenings for, for a month or so. It doesn't really make sense to spend that much on software, but at the same time, it, it speeds up your workflow a lot to use software like this. So the way it works is you kind of, you sketch out your um, dimensions on the model, so you can see some of the markings here, like this is an angle. Um, I actually used calipers and like sized everything exactly right for the buttons and the different controls. Um, and it's pretty accurate, like what you, what you put in the program will almost always come out the same on a 3D printer with like minor tolerance um, differences. And it, the tolerance differences are quite repeatable. So if you print it multiple times, you'll see exactly the same tolerance errors. Um, so this is the inside of the printer. Um, so I, it, the inside of the case is printed in a few different layers. And the idea is that it's designed so it can print without supports on a standard fused deposition modeling printer. The way, the way FDM or FFF technology works is it, it just melts plastic at 210 or 230 degrees in layers. And then a, as it cools, then you get a solid form. But if you ever melt plastic without something below it, then the plastic oozes down before it cools. So you get little um, overhangs or like things hanging off. A, a good example of this is if you look on the back of the model, on the ports. Um, if you look at the top, the top of the ports, you'll notice the plastic kind of bends in a little bit. That's because on that part, it, it was printing from one edge to another edge with a line, and the center of the line wasn't supported, right? So it oozes a little bit. Um, but that's a technique called bridging. So if you print in midair, it looks horrible. If, but if you print between two towers of equal height across them, then it, the plastic tends to drip less. So you, you have like, and depending upon the, the width, you can, um, you can bridge a certain gap without having too much of an issue. Um, so I tried to orient things and split things up so that even in cases where it's printing in midair, there's bridging or overhanging or nice things happening. Um, so it's printable. One of the biggest design challenges on this was getting the hinges to work. Um, and the way the hinges on this, uh, my original design on hinges was I wanted to do a polygon hinge design. This is all my failed hinges. Um, and the idea was that 
you know, I'd print like a 20 sided polygon and then uh, when you rotated, it would go click, 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 right? So you could lock it at multiple positions. And um, that, that failed horribly. Um, just like me playing adventures. Anyone know this game? Ah, uh, this is Zelda 2, which I found impossible as a kid, but somehow now it's really easy. Um, so I tried a different design, which I think is more appropriate for the type of... The problem with the polyhedron hinge is that as you rotate it, um, the edges get uh, smooth. And then it turns from a 20-sided polyhedron to a perfect circle as you open and close it. About 50, 50 opening closings, and then it's a circle. Um, so what I did instead is I, I designed a hinge which relies on, rather than sharp edges, it relies on bending of plastic. So th this, this is the, the hinge shape, and it's two triangles at different, um, slightly different sizes. And you, you trace the perimeter of these two triangles to get your shape. Um, and because, because the triangles are slightly different sizes, rather than a perfect circle, you end up with like a slightly oblong triangle shape where there's po like po kind of pointy edges, not that pointy edges, smooth edges. Um, and when you rotate uh, an object like this, what happens is it's, it's happiest when it's perfectly aligned. So you have um, every, every 120 degrees, you hit another perfect alignment. Um, and in between, it will still move, but it, it stretches the plastic slightly, right? And the nice thing about plastic as a material, like it doesn't like hard edges, but if you have a, a structure like this that, that bends it slightly, then you'll, you'll, um, it, will, it will flex back, it will return back to the original position. Um, so this is something which you can only do in plastic, like you couldn't do this in metal or other materials. And it's, it's because I wanted to make this model entirely printed in plastic without, any, um, without having you buy a hinge from China there's actually no screws in this as well, if you noticed. So e all the screws, points are designed with um, little pins or little ledges so things slide in and, and stay together nicely. Um, so the goal was to make something which was entirely 3D printable except for the electronics inside of it. Um, and I think I mostly accomplished that. This is the, what the hinge looks like with the um, interference. In, there's an interference mode inside of Fusion 360, where you can see how much things overlap. And so this came out to, the magical number was 28.254 cubic millimeters of, over, of overlap. And then you got a hinge, which works fairly well. Um, this is the software Cura I mentioned earlier. This is how you go from a 3D model into uh, instructions for the printer. So this generates the G code. And you also, this is how you lay it out on the platform. Um, and that's open source software. A bunch of other companies use it for their printers besides Ultimaker, um, even though the Ultimaker guys wrote it. Um, this is what it looks like when you're 3D printing. So this is 3D printing the base and the top. And then here's all of the pieces together on one big platform. Um, you also need some buttons. So what I do to make the buttons more flat is I kind of bend the pins outwards with um, pliers so it'll fit in the case nicer. And then soldering to the buttons like this. Um, there's the directional button, which has up, down, left, right, and ground. And then this is the inside of the case. So the bottom layer is a, a Raspberry Pi. Um, then you add a battery to this. I'm using a um, lithium ion battery. I'm using the Adafruit Power Boost for as the controller and charge unit. This is essentially a, a um, chip stolen out of Android cell phones. They use this in a lot of cell phones as the charge units. But it, it's really nice because it, it does power management of the battery so you don't get too low. And it also gives you low, low power indicating lights. It has a micro USB you can use to charge the battery and power the Pi. And when it's unplugged, then the battery powers the Pi. And there's also um, GPIO pins to add a power switch of your own for on and off. So it's really, really handy for projects like this. Um, and then there's the Kippa installed and some of the buttons hanging around. 
Um, the, there's two inserts, which are 3D printed, which go in the center, and this is how the buttons stay in place. So rather than printing a circuit board, like a, like a you know, I didn't want to have something you had to manufacture without 3D printing. The, the button holders themselves are 3D printed. You stick them in, and they fit really snugly. Um, and then there's the buttons mounted, and this is the ribbon cable. The ribbon cable is designed to be easily insertable with your fingers, so you just roll it up and pull it through. Um, this is like attempt three or four, because my first attempts were impossible to do even with tools. Um, I think I spent half an hour trying to snake the wire up and across and then out again. So I have really big holes. One of the disadvantages of the big holes is if you notice there's a crack there, because my, my daughter went, oh, I'm going to close this. And the, the hinge part got caught on the top lip, and she forced it, and it just snapped. Um, so maybe I need a slight redesign on this as well. Um, so kids are, kids are great play testers as well for, for your products. Um, that's the little board which it just connects it. So if, if you happen to break your ribbon cable, which I've done, you can just replace the ribbon cable without replacing the expensive screen connector, which is shown here. Um, this is how it attaches. You have these little pins in the side which go in. Those are the ones with the funky um, oblong triangle shape. And then um, on top of these, you have a pin which locks it in place. So that's how the two side pins stay wedged in place. Um, and you know, again, I was trying to do the entire design without any parts like metal or screws or things. So this was, this was the best design I could come up with, which was an entirely plastic model. Um, I, I lied, I did have an overhang or two, so there's a little bit of material I added to the model here and here, and that makes the model print better, but it's already in the model, so you just print the models as is, and you snap them off with pliers and you're done. Um, and then everything slides together, so even the top screen, it has little rails, you slide it down, and then once it gets down far enough, you just push it in on the pins at the top, and that, the combination of pushing it down and then in locks it very securely so it doesn't come out even with um, even without screws and that's the the finished retropie project okay and I'm gonna give you guys a any, anyone beat Metroid here no okay well Metroid's a fun game here we go and if you if you beat Metroid with I think the good the good the good ending because you have to actually like get all the items or something for this. But they, they show you that um, unlike all the other video game characters at the time, which were which were guys or boys, uh, Metroid actually has a female main character. So I think this is, this is a good role model for us in technology. We should have we should have more women in technology. Like my girls who are, who are budding um, geeks. They help me out with my kids' workshops actually. I do a lot of kids' workshops for um, children who are interested in learning technology. Um, so encourage your kids and your daughters to do more technology. And hopefully, hopefully you guys learned a little bit through this. So the instructions are on Thingiverse if you want to try rebuilding this. Um, they're also in the book, which we're going to give out now. Um, Raspberry Pi with Java. Programming the Internet of Things. Okay, so how are we doing on giveaways? Did you manage to? You still have a pile of stuff there. Okay. All right, so flip it to the mic, so because we're having more audience participation. Flip the button down on the camera as well to the one setting. Yeah. Um, how long did it take you to finish this project? Ah, that's. Th do you, Do you guys think his questions so far have earned him the book? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, I think I think he's earned the book here. Give him the book. He asked, he asked a lot of questions, and I, I, I'm willing to bet you would actually build some of the projects in the book, too. I, I will. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So this, this particular project, um, performance tuning was about two weeks. Um, and that, I did that, like, over a Christmas break. And then the actual, f the electronics was fast. That was, like, a week. Um, and the, the inside of the case, the, or the 3D printing, the design of the case, that was, that was two weeks, but it was, it was two, like, Superman weeks. Because I didn't, I didn't sleep, I didn't do anything except work on the case. 
So basically my, my um, well, it's not true, I did sleep. But my 3D printers were working while I was sleeping. <laughs> so I, have, I, had, um, I was designing during the day, and then when I was done with the design, I would print it on two printers simultaneously to get faster designs. And I would wake up in the morning, and then my daughter and I would like try to break it. <laughs> and then we'd, we'd print another one, and then repeat, repeat, repeat. And it took, I think I, I ended up with almost exactly 14 cases, like one per day, till I got a, a working one, which, which is the one which I showed with um, you know, her playing. OK, so good. Good question. Now, let's, let's do this, because I know we're running late on time. We're going we're gonna to take one more question. And then I, we have giveaways on the chair up here. So for those unfortunate people who do not yet gotten anything, you, you, don't, you don't have as nice of a selection anymore, but you can take one of the items up here. OK, yes. Yeah, yeah, so this, this the question is, is the model of, for the case available? So this um, Thingiverse entry for the RetroPy, um, so you can just you know, search on Thingiverse, or Google will, co Google will probably come up with it as well. So it has, it has the original model files. It has the STL files for you to print. It has all the instructions. Um, you don't, <coughs> don't tell my publisher. You don't, need to, you don't need to buy the book. It actually has all the instructions here as well. So you can actually just go, go here and like, see the whole project and try it. It also has links to the software as well. So I have a GitHub repo with the, the modified code. And um, Andrew has actually taken a bunch of my performance improvements and pushed them back into the original code base. So he's, he's been taking like, my performance fixes and reintegrating them. OK, so thank you guys very much for joining the, the first stop in the night hacking Germany tour. So thank you very much for coming out tonight. Um, and I hope you guys enjoyed both of our, both of our presentations. Oh, and thanks very much for the folks watching the live stream, which is, is going to end very soon. <laughs> yeah, you want to say any words, Mr. Jug Leader? No. Thanks a lot for this great presentation, for both presentations. And yeah, um, I need a 3D printer, really. Yeah, yeah.